Good evening and thank you for joining the UP Community Health Town Hall series. This evening's program is about vision and hearing and we'll be joined by several expert panelists throughout the region to talk about vision and hearing issues. The program is being hosted by the Center for Rural Health at Northern Michigan University and it's been organized in partnership with the Health Research Institute at Michigan Technological University. Our expert panelists this evening joining us are Dr. Kelly Cam, professor and epidemiologist at Michigan Technological University, Dr. Melissa Collard, audiologist at Upper Peninsula Audiology in Houghton, Dr. Sean Rooney, ophthalmologist for Eye Associates of Marquette, Julie Shaw, Executive Director for UP Superior Alliance for Independent Living, also known as SAIL. And Jennifer Dockers is a hearing program consultant with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Kelly Kim giving us a little bit of statistics right now about the hearing in particular. Thank Hi, you, Kelly. Lisa. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm pleased to be co-hosting here with Northern Michigan and Michigan Tech having a joint project here. Um, so as anybody who's got um, an, an older person in their life or is an older person, I think we all know that uh, some of our sensory impairments have a huge impact on our adult population, but we also see problems within our young population. So we can't forget those too. Um, so I'm excited to have Jennifer on to, to talk about what we have here um, in Michigan for our younger populations. So to give you a little bit of an idea about the burden of hearing loss within the United States. So these are, are national numbers that we have here. It is hearing loss is the third most chronic, most common chronic physical ailment in the United States, and that's after arthritis and heart disease. So it's a very, very common health condition that we need to be concerned about. It's twice as common as diabetes or cancer. Um, so we're looking at about 20% of our adult population has, um, or 20% of our overall population has hearing difficulties. So it's about 48 million people across the United States. And as I said, it's more common among our older populations and it is definitely associated as we age, our hearing does get worse, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can do about it. Um, so about um, some estimates are about half the people over 60 have some level of hearing loss, um, but only about 50 to 30% of those people have hearing aids. So um, we're not getting reaching the people who really, you know, who we are really reaching out to everybody who has that problem. And in particular, when we look at it, typical with many of the things we see across our rural populations is that rural adults are more likely to report a difficulty hearing than our urban populations. Um, and this has a variety of impacts on our health and our economics of the country. So I would like to introduce Dr. Collard to speak about audiology and hearing in our Thank populations. You. Thanks for having me. So, um, Especially in the UP, uh, we see a lot of um, causes of hearing loss that we don't typically see in, in bigger areas just because of the noise exposure that a lot of people have up here. And that is one of the biggest contributing factors of hearing loss um, in our older population, especially in the UP, is just the, the noise exposure that they, they have, um, whether it be hunting or, um, you know, logging or just a lot of the, the professions that we have in the area, um, we tend to see that, that noise-induced hearing loss be much more common in our area. Um, so some of the things that we see in our practice, and I think um, most people see in the field of audiology is just the impacts that hearing loss have on, on people. Um, the social isolation, iso excuse me, isolation that it causes, you know, if you think about it, why would you want to go out to dinner or be with family when you can't hear what's going on? I have so many people that sit in my office and say, I don't want to be with people because I miss so much. And then they laugh at me or I'm just twiddling my thumbs because I don't know what's going on in a conversation. So I think that's one of the saddest things about hearing loss um, is just that people don't wanna be around other people because they miss so much of the conversation. Another thing that we see is just the progression of cognitive decline. Um, there's so many studies out there showing that, you know, hearing loss contributes to a faster rate of atro atrophy in the brain. 
Um, and, and we will see that cognitive decline happen much faster when people don't do something about their hearing loss. Common causes of hearing loss, not just noise exposure, um, genetics. Uh, we have a, an interesting population in especially the Western UP and that we have a very strong genetic component to a lot of our hearing losses. I will see some families, you know, let's say they have eight or 10 kids and I will see five or six of the kids who have the exact same hearing loss. Um, and that will carry down through the generations. Um, certain medications can cause hearing loss. The natural aging process, like you said, um, will contribute to hearing loss. Any kind of physical damage to the ear, so ruptured eardrums, um, you know, blows to the head. Uh, I have a fair number of hockey players and football players who are on my caseload just because of the, the injuries that they've had um, to, their, to their noggins. Wax. Uh, especially when people are wearing hearing protection for jobs, that wax doesn't have a chance to get out of the ears. Can't tell you how many times I look in ears and people say, I'm really not hearing well, well we just need to pull a plug of, of wax out of there. Other things that can cause hearing loss, um, infections like meningitis that will, will have a very high fever associated with it. Uh, different antibiotics you can be on like gentamicin, you know, high doses of aspirin, certain chemotherapy drugs, we will monitor uh, people who are on chemotherapy just to make sure their hearing isn't changing tremendously. Dr. Collier, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in the past several years, earbuds, you know, have come more into play for people, um, depending on people's age. If you're my age, it was Walkman back in the day. <laughs> but um, now people are actually putting more things in their ears. Can you talk, uh, have you seen any kind of trending or anything that you've noticed from the patients that you've served as far as impacts or effects from using sure. earbuds? I mean, my rule of thumb, especially when a kiddo comes in with a parent is if they have earbuds in and you're sitting next to them, can you hear the music coming out of their earbuds? If you can, it's too loud. And there's limiters that parents can set on their kids' devices to make sure that it's at a safe level. You know, something that I've just loved that has happened over the past few years is, you know, you'll get an alert on your phone or on your watch saying, hey, the sound is too loud, whether it's the, the, the ambient noise or the actual music that you're listening to. But there is definitely a, a noticeable increase in the kids that I have seen who have a, a noise induced type of hearing loss. Not so much from music around here, but shooting guns, riding four wheelers, snowmobiles. Um, you know, I, I will ask kids who are eight, nine, 10 years old, well, what kind of noise are you around? Well, nothing. Well, do you mow the lawn in the summer for mom and dad? Well, yeah, but that's not noise. It is, and, and noise exposure like that is cumulative. So yeah, you may only be mowing the lawn for an hour, but you're doing it twice a week all summer long, it adds up over time. So we have a lot of discussions, not just with kids, but with adults too, who think it's too late to protect their hearing, you know, foam plugs, headphones, whatever, something to protect your hearing when you're doing those sorts of things. You know, when you talk about hunting, it makes me think, you know, it makes me wonder if they cover ear protection during the gun safety classes and if they talk they do about that. yeah okay. they do and and both of my kiddos I have two teenagers they've both been through hunter safety and I, I remember both of them coming home and saying oh my gosh mom they talked about it they talked about the plugs we keep in our cabinet so yeah it is a part of hunter safety and really what I find is it it's up to parents. If kids see their parents wearing hearing protection when they're mowing the lawn when they're sighting in their rifle when they're doing those things they do it too right. so yeah, definitely by example, like so many other things. Right. Um, can you t give us an idea? We might have some listeners this evening who have never been to um, an audiologist and they wouldn't know what to expect. Can you uh, kind of give them an idea of what a typical appointment is like and maybe dispel sure. some of the myths that might be existing out there? Yeah. And the nice thing about our profession is it is pretty painless to come in and see us. You know, when you come in, we do a pretty thorough case history, you know, history of noise exposure, history of different medications. You know, we like to get a picture of what's going on in your world. Um, we check the ears to make sure there's no wax in them, to, to look at the eardrums to make sure that they look healthy. Typically we'll do a test called the tympanogram that, that will um, 
put pressure into the ears to see what the eardrums are doing. And then we do what we call a diagnostic hearing test. So we test all of the parts of the, the ear, the eardrum, the cochlea, which is the hearing organ, the nerve that goes to the brain. Um, and we get a good picture of how well you're hearing different frequencies, um, different words and quiet. We test speech and noise, which is a, is a really important one because right we don't live in a bubble um, and then we spend a lot of time just counseling on what the hearing test is what it looks like what it means good coping and communication strategies and then where to go from here for some people it's as easy as hey you need to get the wax taken out of your ears for some people we will refer them to um, back to their doctor or to an ear nose and throat physician if if we um see things that maybe it's medically correctable. Um, for some people, it's hearing aids. For other people, it's cochlear implants or auditory brainstem implants. So uh, we do spend a lot of time counseling at the end of the appointment of where do we go from here? What's the game plan? That's great. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about symptoms that would demonstrate the need for emergency care versus you know, when should they react depending on what symptoms? Sure. Um, you know, the, the really the only emergency in the audiology world is a sudden hearing loss. So uh, it happens more often than a lot of people think. They will just wake up one morning and the hearing in one ear will just be completely gone. Rarely is it both sides. Um, some people will come in and say, well, I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe I just had wax in my ear. I thought I had an ear infection, but it is a medical emergency because time is of the essence. And there's treatments that, that can take place if you do get to an ear, nose, and throat doctor, an otologist, or the emergency room in time. That's great. Um, can you talk a little bit about tips for people um, who might communicate with others that have hearing impairments? And what are some things that, that we can do to, to better communicate with people that might be experiencing some hearing loss? Sure. And for a lot of people, that is what they need. You know, um, people with a more mild hearing loss or somebody who's just not ready for hearing aids or, or any sort of intervention yet. I spend a lot of time doing marriage counseling in this office. So, um, you know, just talking to the spouse, hey, when you're talking to your wife, you need to come into the room and talk to her and look in her face before you just have a conversation because that's where the arguments will start is, oh, I didn't hear you say that or I missed that part of the conversation. You know, getting somebody's attention, I have, um, the sweetest couple and they came in the other day just tickled because she now knows to get her husband's attention she throws a ball of yarn at him so that's their that's their communication strategy i know that i need to listen when that ball of yarn hits me you know, whatever your your technique is but we are not meant to communicate through walls or from other rooms or with our you know phones in front of our faces we are meant to communicate face to face and that that visual input for people who have hearing loss it's important for all of us and i think we all saw that during the masking during covid um, but especially if you have hearing loss being able to fill in the gaps with you know being able to see somebody's face um, not yelling because i don't know about you but i can't yell and be happy or look kind or nice because most people who have hearing loss when you yell at them they think you're mad at them. So, you know, slowing down your rate of speech, making eye contact, um, asking the question, you know, I said this, what did you hear? Or what did you hear me say just then? So being able to, you know, have that conversation back and forth. And it's not easy because we are part of a society that is on the go constantly and we don't slow down. So really working on those sort of good communication strategies with our loved ones, who have hearing loss is really important. That's great advice. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many people are going to go out and buy yarn after this. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you, as it's yarn and not a baseball, we're we're doing good. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I, I want to mention, I guess, if, if we have new listeners joining us uh, tonight, this is the UP Community Health Town Hall series, and we're talking about hearing and vision. I'm joined by several experts throughout the region, as well as an individual from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. If you have questions that you would like to ask the panelists and you're watching the Zoom webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A button and we will monitor the questions and do our best to ask those. If you are listening on the radio, you're welcome to email questions to the email address ruralhealth at nmu.edu, and we will do our best to get to those questions as well. 
So thank you, Dr. Collard. Um, Kelly, did you wanna talk about uh, our next topic? Sure. So one of the other major sensory impairments that we have and many people suffer from are visual impairments. Um, I know myself, I got my first pair of glasses when I was in kindergarten. Um, I have a ch one child that's like me and one that's not. Um, and as I'm aging, my vision is changing along with everybody else's. So when we look at the number of people and the burden of disease, we're looking at about 12 million Americans or more that are over 40 years old that have some level of visual impairment. Um, that can be a medical condition. It can be um, nearsightedness, farsightedness, all of that fits in there. Because our population is aging, that number is expected to double by 2050. So we're looking at a pretty massive number of people who need vision impairment. And like with hearing impairment, there's a lot of people who simply don't have, um, haven't been to see an, an eye doctor um, or an, an eye care professional to address that issue. Um, so we've got one of the other estimates that CDC had um, was that 93 million Americans are at high risk for vision loss. Um, and, and again, that's related in part to lack of being able to have seen an eye doctor and about half of those 93 million people have not seen an eye doctor in the last uh, last year. Similar to um, to vision or to hearing impairment, rural adults are at higher risk of having impairment than our urban counterparts. Um, and again, it's not just a problem within the our older adults; it is a problem within children. And again, same kind of impacts with so um, with health impacts and um, also looking at um, impacts to our economy for people who have vision impairment that can be corrected and have not had that correction done. So I would like to introduce Dr. Sean Rooney to speak about our eye care and vision care. So, so it is uh, Glaucoma Awareness Month. So I was going to talk about that for a few minutes. Glaucoma is um, a disease of the optic nerve. The optic nerve is like a big data cable and it takes the vision information from your eye to your brain. It's got a million and a half nerve fibers in it. And in glaucoma, those nerve fibers get killed off one at a time in a specific pattern. And it's progressive and it can blind you. It's one of the few things that will actually blind you so you can't even see light. Early on, there are no symptoms. People can have glaucoma for many, many years and not notice it until it gets really severe. If, if someone shows up in my office and they have symptoms from glaucoma, I'm pretty worried about them because I know that they've already had pretty severe damage to their optic nerve. And what happens is you lose your peripheral vision. You can, you can end up coming right down to a tiny little tunnel of vision, and then eventually that can get snuffed out. Because we're really good at treating glaucoma these days and good at, at catching it early, very, very few people ever go blind anymore. There are a few, but it's very few. The treatment involves and, and revolves around lowering the eye pressure. So we know that if we can lower your eye pressure enough, it will protect the optic nerve from new damage and it will stop the disease from progressing. It, the treatment works best if we catch it early. If, if um, somebody comes to me and their pressure is a little high and they really don't have any damage left at, at, yet to their optic nerve, I, I'm really confident that the disease is never going to affect their life as long as, long as I can take care of them because I, I can protect that from happening. If somebody shows up to me symptomatic, I know that their pressure needs to be super low in order to protect it from getting worse because it snowballs and the optic nerve gets more sensitive as you get more damage. So then I'm more worried about them. So we really want to catch it early. The way that we catch it early is every patient that we see, we look for all of the risk factors. Um, we look at their optic nerves and we measure their pressure. And because there aren't any symptoms, you're not going to feel if your pressure is high and you're not going to see that you're losing your peripheral vision until it's really bad. So the, the key is to get seen and, and get examined. Um, the treatments that we have, the first ones are just eye drops with medicine, and they're usually pretty easy to use. The one I use the most commonly is a once a day drop. It's real easy to use. And I have a lot of glaucoma patients that are on a once a day drop and never have a problem for the rest of their life. Um, and then if drops aren't enough, there's laser treatments that we can do, and we can also go on to surgery. Um, some of the risk factors 
for glaucoma is age, of course, just like almost everything else. If you're over 40, your risk is, is higher. A family history of glaucoma is important. It's not a genetic disease, but sometimes it runs in families. Um, if you're African, Hispanic, or Asian heritage, you're at higher risk. The eye pressure is one. People that are very farsighted or very nearsighted, a strong glasses prescription is a relative risk factor, although that's less of a big deal. Um, eye trauma is a risk factor. Long-term use of steroid medications is, is a risk factor. Um, and then uh, some of the systemic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, or any of the other vascular diseases are all risk factors for glaucoma. And then the risk factors that we see in the office are a high high pressure, um, appearance of the optic nerve that we call cupping, where there's a, a dish in the center of the optic nerve head that I can see when I look in, um, thin corneas, the corneas, the clear part of the eye in front, that's an independent risk factor as well. That's great information. I think one of the most important things that you said, really, that we try to talk about all rural health aspects is preventative care. Yep. You know, taking care of yourself while you're healthy. Don't wait until something's really, really wrong to go in because just treatment options and, you know, what can happen permanently versus, you know, being reversed with medications and treatment, that, that's a big difference. So I just want to hit on that because we can't stress that enough for people, you know, who just kind of ignore signs and symptoms. We really want to encourage that they take care of themselves and stay healthy. So what, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how often people should get their eyes checked? Sure. So there, there are fairly specific um, pediatric screening uh, recommendations, and they go on a long time. But, but um, essentially, it, when you're an infant, the pediatrician does the initial screening, and they'll look at they look at babies as, as newborns, and then they look at them after a few months and all through the first year for specific things, and then to get to uh, an eye care professional, you want to have your kids, they should get checked about age three or between age three and five. And then again, at about age five, about the time you're starting school. And sometimes you can, you can get that just through the school screening that happens. But if that's not happening, bring your child to see an eye care professional around age five. And then for adults, if you're not having any trouble and you're just going to get checked out once in your twenties, maybe twice in your 30s, and then at about 40. And then over 65, we recommend that you get seen every year or two. My standard is over 70 I see patients every year. And then if you have a family history of eye disease, you need to get seen as, whenever you, as soon as you find out about that. If you have diabetes, you should be seen once a year, um, at least. And most primary care doctors are really good about making that happen. And that's because it's really important information for the primary care doctor to help you manage your diabetes because they get feedback from us. The eye is one of the, is the only organ that we can actually look at and see damage of diabetes. Now, some of the other organs that are really sensitive to diabetes are the brain and the heart and the kidneys. We can't look at those because they're all covered up. But I can look at your retinas and the blood vessels in your retina and if you have something bad going on there, you likely have something bad going on with the other, those other organs as well, if you have diabetes. Um, and then, of course, if you have glaucoma or macular degeneration or any other eye diseases, then it's, it's, all, it's way more common. And, and I will decide. I will tell you, I'll recommend you when you want to come next. Yeah, that's great. So can you give us an example um, similar to Dr. Collard about what would people expect if they've never been in for an eye appointment? What does that look like? What does that consist of? Um, sure. Kind of paint that picture of what to expect if you haven't been in before. Yeah. So like, like the hearing exams, eye exams are fairly painless. We're not going to do anything that hurts. It might shine some light at you. Um, not a lot of poking. So usually one of my technicians will start everything and they'll take a they'll take a medical history and ask you about your family history and your surgical history and what medications you're on and any vision problems that you're having um, or any concerns that you have and we we most people we will measure your refractive error meaning your need for glasses with an automated machine which just gives us something to start with um, and then 
the patient will be brought to me and I will look at your eyes. And we have a, a instrument called a slit lamp that's got a bright light. It's kind of like a microscope. It lets me look at your eyes really closely. Doesn't hurt. There's a little bit of bright light involved. Um, and we, there's a lot of other little simple tests, like I'll hold my finger up and have you move it. My technicians do that too. And, and see, see what your peripheral vision is like off to the side versus to the center. And, and we, we will press, we will check your eye pressure. Um, a lot of people have experience with their eye pressure being checked with a air puff tonometer where you little peel puff of air. We don't use that in our office, actually. Um, we'll put a drop in that make your eye numb and we just touch the eye really gently and you won't, you won't even feel that. And then if you need glasses, we'll measure your, we'll measure your glasses prescription um, manually with the machine that's kind of like this with a bunch of lenses in it. And we'll show you different lenses and you can you choose which ones that look best. And sometimes we'll dilate your pupils. Um, we don't dilate everybody every visit, but we do it pretty often. And what we do is we put drops in and it makes your pupil big. And for a couple hours, your, your bright lights would be extra bright. And for younger people, it, it might make it harder for you to see at near because you won't be able to focus at near. But it only lasts for a few hours. And so you might, we might send you home with uh, sunglasses for that. Great. Yeah, I was the I was excited when my eye doctor changed from the puff to the drops. Yeah, because I, I've never worn contacts. I'm not used to putting things in my eyes and I couldn't stop blinking every time they would want to mm -hmm. you know, put that puff of air in there. So, um, so another thing more recent, uh, similar to earbuds and the hearing topic that we were talking about, can you talk a little bit about blue light? Um, sure. I know a couple of years ago I walked in and one of my colleagues sat on these fancy glasses and I, I never saw anything like it. And that was the first time I actually heard about it. So I wondered if you could talk with our, so, our yeah, audience hear a little bit about that. You might hear about blue light from computer screens and digital devices. It's not dangerous. It's not doing damage to your eyes. You will get way more blue light exposure going outside on a sunny day than you're going to ever get from your computer screen. So the blue light blocking glasses are really just a marketing gimmick. They're not saving you from anything. Um, the thing about blue light is it, it does scatter a little bit more than other colors of light. So if you wear like yellow tinted glasses, you might find that you have a little increase of contrast. Um, and that's not going to hurt you to wear those, but there's no need to spend money on those. They're not recommended at all. There is no scientific evidence that blue light is damaging. Um, one of the things that has come out and is real is that blue light can can mess up your circadian rhythms and make it harder for you to get to sleep. So a lot of people go to bed looking at their phone or reading on a tablet. Um, and it turns out that any light, especially bright light around the time that you're about ready to go to sleep is can mess up your circadian rhythm and affect your melatonin levels and things like that and make it harder for you to get good sleep. So it's recommended not to do that, not to do, not to have anything shining in your face within the, the last few hours before bedtime. And it turns out that blue light is particularly bad just for that particular thing. It's not doing damage to you, but it has a bigger effect in, in um, affecting the circadian rhythms. Great. So um, I see that we do have one question that's come in by email, um, and we have a, a member that would like to know uh, what the, somebody who doesn't wear glasses currently, but they're wondering what kind of activities they do that they should be protecting their eyes. So are, are there things like certain activities where people should go out of their way to protect their, their vision? Yeah, anytime that you can, that there might be something coming at you, flying at you to hit you in the eye, you should be wearing safety glasses, mowing the lawn, splitting wood, working with your hands in general at any workbench, using any power tools, but especially things like grinders. Um, and in fact, when I, if I'm going to use a grinder, I wear safety glasses and a full face shield because sometimes you can get stuff that'll bounce around your glasses. And I've had people get bad facial injuries from grinding accidents as well. So basically, if if you can, if what you're doing could possibly throw something at you, at your face, you should be wearing eye protection. That's great advice. Um, can you also provide a few examples of 
you know, there are people who might have a symptom and just kind of blow it off, you know, and just kind of ignore it or see if it gets yeah. worse. You know, at, at what point, what's the difference between um, a symptom where they can just make an appointment and come in versus if they need to get to an emergency department or, or do something that's a little more urgent? If you have sudden loss of vision or progressive loss of vision over a short time, meaning days or weeks in one eye or both eyes, and it's pretty profound loss of vision, like you've lost half your visual field or that eye has gone dark, um, that's an emergency. And there, there are a lot of things that can make those kind of things happen that we can fix if we catch it, if we catch it early. And if you go too long, we might not be able to fix. Um, one of those things is called a retinal detachment, where the retina, which is on the back of your eye, it's kind of like the film in your camera, can actually detach off of your eye wall. When that happens, it looks like a dark curtain coming across your vision. If you see that and you have a dark curtain coming across your vision and that's moving toward the center, that's a retinal detachment until we prove otherwise. And you need to be seen that day. Um, whether you whether you come to our office or the emergency room really is based on what else is going on. Like, you know, if you have you're in an accident, you have a lot of bad injuries and you have an eye injury as part of that, you might need to do these other you might need to deal with your other injuries first. You need to go to the emergency room. If you just have vision loss and, and it's during our office hours, call our office first and we'll get you right in. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, if you're just tuning in now, uh, we are talking with experts across the UP and lower Michigan about hearing and vision and what that means uh, right now for our Upper Peninsula residents. Uh, this is the UP Community Health Town Hall Series. And we are accepting questions from listeners and viewers, um, either in the Q&A, if you're watching the Zoom webinar, or you may email us at ruralhealth at nmu.edu. And next up, we would like to talk uh, with Julie Shaw. She is the Executive Director of Superior Alliance for Independent Living, otherwise known as SAIL. And Julie, we'd like you to tell us a little bit Sale and some of the efforts that you're making to work with the clients who are experiencing vision and hearing impairments. So welcome, Julie. Thank you, Elise. And first of all, I'd like to say I feel very privileged to follow Dr. Rooney, who um, has removed the cataracts from both of my eyes. So I feel very privileged to have better vision that way. And I might have to call on Dr. Collard because for that marriage counseling, because recently learned that I have 40% loss in one of my ears as well. So uh, what is SAIL? SAIL is a resource. It's a resource for community members. So we are one of 15 centers for independent living in the state of Michigan. Um, we are the only one in the UP. So we cover all 15 counties of the Upper Peninsula. We know that one in five individuals live with a disability. Um, we talked about two of them this evening, but there are many others. What can we do to assist individuals with hearing and vision loss? Um, we have an assistive technology program, and we can bring to individuals um, different types of assistive technology that they can try. Sometimes we help them to purchase things um, through our one in five program, which is a donation program that we have here at SAIL um, from our annual campaign. But anything from amplified phones that might assist individuals um, to alarms that shake the bed so they get up on time for um, work if they uh, sleep through alarms to magnification devices. And we even have communication devices for individuals to try. Some of those we loan to them to try in their homes to see if they would be helpful to them before they would um, purchase or look into purchasing them. And some of them we do have in stock to just um, offer to the individual to keep. Um, so we work with um, agencies and we refer people to resources like the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. Um, we are very connected with all kinds of resources across the Upper Peninsula. Um, so we are um, just a resource for individuals. And how do you receive resource our services from us? You just need to self-identify. 
Um, we don't have a lot of hoops to jump through. You just call sale, you tell us what your needs are. We work on your goals with you. We are person-centered, so we work with whatever goal it is that you have determined that you need to work on. Uh, we work a lot with helping individuals to stay employed. So if they have a hearing loss like myself or um, and they need some adaptive equipment to stay employed in their job, um, we work with people on what those that adaptive equipment could potentially be. Um, we are run by people with disabilities, so we're peer-to-peer -peer support here for you. So the majority of our staff, the majority of our leadership team, and the majority of our board are all pe persons with lived experiences. We're all people with disabilities, um, both visible and invisible disabilities. Um, and we promote accessible communities throughout the entire Upper Peninsula through advocacy and education. So we're all about education, educating people about what their disability might be and how to advocate for themselves in their jobs or wherever. So Julie, when, if, you know, you mentioned that you, you cover the entire Upper Peninsula, you know, for sale, um, do you have physical locations throughout the UP where they go or do they call or do they go to a website or do you go to them or do they come to you? Like how would somebody access, you know, Thank and you for use Great those question. services? We do have an intake process here in our agency. So you could call 906-228-5744. We also have a website. It's www.upsail.org. And we do have um, remote staff. We have a staff member in the Sault Ste. Marie area that covers the counties over in that area. We have one in the Escanaba area, and we have one in the Antonag and Gogebic Ironwood area. Other than that, our staff are located in a Marquette office, but we do travel to you. We come to you wherever you are. Um, unless you wanna come to us, we will come to you. Thanks. And I know, Julie, you've personally been involved in a lot of community meetings throughout the Upper Peninsula. Um, you and your staff do a great job at staying engaged and trying to learn more about what those needs are. And, and I think that really goes a long way, you know, to serving our population. And there are people who are afraid to ask for help, or they're afraid that they're going to be judged or labeled or you know, and I think you guys do a great job at really putting people's minds at ease and, and really helping people to thrive and, you know, remain independent as long as possible. I think that really goes a long way. So thank you for what you do. And thank you for sharing that. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we are persons with disabilities. So we're living that life and we understand we have a different kind of understanding um, because we are living with those disabilities. And um, I think that's what really helps people to feel comfortable with us and our services um, because we're run by people with disabilities. And, and who Julie, better to know, a... you know, what might help? Go ahead, Kelly, sorry. I, sorry, I did, Julia, so um, in for an employer, um, to Elise's point, you know, that it's great to be able to have people advocate for themselves but also not to always put the burden on those individuals. Are there things that an employer can do for, especially for many of those invisible disabilities or if there's hearing or vision loss that are not necessarily recognized to make their, uh, their workplace more inclusive, particularly for a vision or hearing impairment that is not maybe necessarily diagnosed um, or people are aware of it? Could they reach out to you? Do you have any tips for what they might be able to do as an employer? Absolutely. We wish that we could get more into um, educating businesses, et cetera, on what they could do. Um, and remember, it has to start with person-centeredness. So that person has to ask or advocate or want, you know, that um, accommodation or whatever in their workplace. But it's the one wonderful thing that we do very well here at SAIL. As I shared, I do have a, a newfound hearing loss. Um, masks really made a difference in my world. I was really struggling to understand people. And so I did buy those shields that um, Dr. Rooney discussed for many of our staff to wear when we were working with people with hearing impairments. And then I realized that I was one of those people, you know, if I was in a room full of people and certain sounds like Dr. Collard talked about the soft, you know, white noises, the soft, the Fs, the THs, those kinds of things were dropping for me. And I kept thinking, all right, there has to be something that, um, you know, I need to check this out. I'm, I'm 59. I'm at a point where, and I was a chronic ear infection. I had meningitis. I had many things. So that could very well have been from sickness from a child. So a lot of learning took place. And so I was learning how to accommodate staff that had concerns or consumers that would come in. We have, like I said, some communication devices. 
Um, but we do assist many individuals who are concerned about losing their jobs because they're afraid of asking for those accommodations um, when actually it's something that a business should do. So yes, um, Dr. Kelly, I really appreciate that question because we can teach um, businesses, we can work with them, we can really assist them in learning what those accommodations can and should be that they should do for individuals to keep them happily employed. And sometimes it's something very simple. Like I said, the bed shaker um, to help somebody get up for somebody who's chronically um, late for work, they just weren't hearing the alarm and they might set 10 of them and they still didn't hear it. Um, so shaking the bed, what an easy solution for that or wearing a watch that had a shaker on it so that they could, you know, that would physically make wake them up. Little things sometimes can make a big difference for individuals. So Julie, I know we've talked about this before, but um, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the barriers to care that SAIL has been able to help, not just with hearing and vision, but just across the board. We've talked about community health workers a little bit. Um, and just some of the, the social determinants of health that people are experiencing. And I, I think of those factors impacting all aspects of their health and, and not just certain ones. Um, can you talk a little bit about what SAIL is doing to try to work through some of those barriers? One of the biggest barriers to healthcare for all individuals that we see is transportation. Um, and I don't think it's just unique to the UP. I think it's nationwide. But that is something that really does, um, when Dr. Collar talked about individuals who are hearing impaired that socially isolate, then think about for them having to call and even make that appointment for a health appointment. And then think about the barrier of transportation, like the barriers just keep piling on. It's not just being isolated, it's how do I get to that appointment if I'm not a person who can any longer drive for myself? Public transportation doesn't really exist um, UP-wide. Um, certain areas have do a great job of it. Other areas have nothing. Um, so I would say that the biggest barrier for healthcare for individuals would be transportation in our community. Thank you, Julie. Um, we had another question that came in by email. Um, and so I'm gonna actually hop back to Dr. Collard and Dr. Rooney for a minute. Um, this had to do with insurance coverage for services and whether or not having hearing and vision is covered by insurances and what would people expect from an expense standpoint or a cost standpoint. So Dr. Collard, why don't we start with you first? So that's a big question because there are how many different insurances out there? Um, Audiology is very different than any other medical professional in that you don't always have direct access to us. What that means is we need a referral from your primary care physician saying something medical is going on, a decrease in hearing, sudden decrease in hearing, uh, a referral that just states, hey, there's something medical going on and we can bill your insurance. If we have that referral, insurance should pay for your visit. Now, if you have a copay, a deductible, you will be responsible for that. But Medicare, Medicaid, um, UPHP, Aetna, Blue Cross, you name it. Um, there's been, in my many years of doing this, very few insurances that do not include a hearing test within its, within its parameters. But that referral is important for us to be able to bill insurance and say, hey, this is a medical thing. I think that's also probably wise because then after you see that patient, that communication is also being trans transferred back to that person's primary care provider Absolutely. just to keep everybody on the same page. Yep, yep. And that's something that we really love. I think UP wide, it's something that I, I, I love about living here is that you don't just have one professional working with you, you have a team. And you know, I know most of the local doctors, most of the NPs, the PAs, um, the, the speech pathologists that you name it and being able to pick up the phone and say, I'm really worried about this person and they need to go somewhere, you know, let's make a plan for them. So yeah, definitely that communication is really important. Thank you. That definitely is one of the benefits to living up here. <laughs> Dr. Rooney, any comments from, from the vision side? Yeah, because um, in my office, the, the insurance can be really confusing because people, there's, and the insurance companies make it worse. There's medical insurance and then there's vision insurance. So almost all the patients I see are covered by their medical insurance. And 
all the medical things I do are covered just like any other doctor, any other surgery that you have, it's on your regular medical insurance. You do not need vision insurance to come to my office. What vision insurance is for is to pay for glasses. It pays for glasses and contact lenses and the part of the exam where we actually measure the prescription for those things. That's the only thing that covers. And you don't, and if you don't have that insurance, but you have medical insurance, you can come to my office. We will do a medical exam. If you need glasses or you want to get glasses, we will do all of those other things. But then buying the glasses is it's just like buying them in store. That, that's your responsibility. And how much they cost depends on what you choose. You can choose really inexpensive glasses or really expensive glasses. The prices go way up high as everybody who knows who wears glasses has, has, has seen. But don't be confused about vision insurance. You don't need vision insurance to come to my office. If you have a medical problem, you don't need medical insur vision insurance for that. Your medical insurance will cover you. I think that's that's great advice because I think it's great for people to understand the pathway to access the care and just the importance to access that, you know, as soon as they identify that they need to see somebody. So thank you for that. Uh, for our listeners, if you're just now joining us, uh, this is the UP Community Health Town Hall series. And tonight we are talking about hearing and vision with experts across the region. Um, we have uh, questions that we're accepting right now on our Q&A if you are on webinar and Zoom. And we also have an email set up. You can submit questions to ruralhealth at nmu.edu. And our next guest, Jennifer, you've been so patient, thank you, <laughs> is Jennifer Dockers. And she is joining us from the Michigan, Depe I'm sorry, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, she is a uh, hearing screening program, um, you know, working with children going into the school system, and she's going to talk a little bit about their program. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Elise. Um, I oversee the Michigan Hearing Screening Program, and this is a program where our local health departments employ hearing screening technicians who go into all of our preschool programs, Head Start, large child care centers, um, private and public schools, um, charter schools, you name it. If there's a school out there, we're typically going in there and screening those kids hearing. And are you screening, is it just a like a one-time screening or are there different age levels that you go through or how does that, how does that program work? Michigan is fortunate that we actually have a law that requires hearing and vision screening services for our kids. So for hearing, it's mandated that children are screened at least once between the ages of three and five. And then again, in kindergarten, second and fourth grades. And the vision screening program, they do preschool also. So at least once between the ages of three and five, and then vision screening takes place in first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth grades. We're really fortunate that we have this law. There are a lot of states out there that hearing or vision screening might take place prior to children entering kindergarten, and then they're not screened again until an issue comes up. And at that point, you know, you may have all kinds of delays that have already occurred. And for, for parents who um, haven't had the joy yet to have their child enter kindergarten, <laughs> can, you, can you talk just briefly about uh, what that means for a child to go through that screening, what that process might be like? Sure, um, it really varies from school district to school district. Many school dis districts do host kindergarten roundups, which hearing and vision would be invited to attend. Then parents bring their child in, they can have those screenings performed there. If that school district doesn't happen to host roundups, which it seems like this is a cyclical thing that sometimes they do and then they quit and then they come back full circle so many years down the road. Um, but if, if a parent does not have the opportunity to attend a roundup, 
and they need to get their hearing or their child's hearing or vision screen, they can contact their local health department, hearing and vision screening program, and the technicians there will make an appointment for them. Parents bring the kids right into the office and they can have that done. Um, and typically what they do is give them a slip of paper so that when they do go to their school registration, they can provide that to the school. So the school knows that this indeed was done prior to their first day of kindergarten. Do you know, uh, when did this law first come into play? I mean, I know, I remember I went through it when I was a child, but how long has this been around? It's been around a long time. So everybody who's on the panel and probably most of the people who are listening have been screened by the hearing and vision program. Um, it started back in 1949. And at that time, it wasn't all encompassing throughout the state. It started in little pockets throughout the state on a voluntary level. And then it eventually became a statewide run program. So, you know, this year is probably, I think, our 74th year um, that we've been around. So it, it, we've, we are very fortunate that we've lasted this long. Um, when you have a program like ours that is funded through our taxpayer dollars, general fund dollars, anytime there is a budget crunch, um, general fund dollars are scrutinized pretty heavily and everybody cringes in hopes that you're not the one who's gonna get cut. But we've we've been through that at some point and um, we're reinstated shortly after the program dollars were cut, thankfully. Um, but many states, like I mentioned earlier, they may have had programs similar to ours and their program dollars get yanked and it's up to parents just to make sure their kids have good hearing and good vision. I think, I think Jennifer, you answered that uh, one of the questions that I had on that. And um, so this is at no cost to the parents, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then, um, so in our area here, we have many people who are homeschooled or um, given the crisis of childcare that many of us are experiencing across the nation um, and certainly in rural areas. If you are, if you have a child who's not in a daycare preschooler, who's not in, in preschool or daycare um, or a homeschooled child, um, how are they getting this information that they need to get the screening done? And would they go, like you mentioned, just contact their local health department or how would they go about getting that screening done? Yeah, the local health departments are fantastic about advertising their services. Um, it's typically put out in community newsletters, community newspapers. Um, it's on their website, you know, so it, they're really pretty savvy with their social media campaigns. Um, you know, like Dr. Rooney was talking about, this is glaucoma month. We have a, a Better Speech and Hearing Month is in May. There's other vision months out there. Um, so the health departments typically um, take advantage of those months too to really advertise heavily about their services and, and what's available. Um, there are, um, even before COVID, we had a lot of the kids who were um, in virtual schools and those schools tend to be very strict about not letting kids start their programs until they have their hearing and vision um, performed, which is fantastic. I really applaud them for that. So it's it's a it's a really good program. It's amazing how many kids each year we find who have undiagnosed hearing and vision problems. And you know, we're doing this all over the state of Michigan, every county has a hearing and vision screening program. So between the two programs, we see about 1.1 million kids every year. And vision definitely has a higher referral rate because you're screening you know, kids during their adolescence when their eyes are changing a lot more. And I think the, the referral rate for vision, for the vision program is probably about 10 to 15 percent um, for hearing. We see lots of kids who have middle ear problems um, and our referral rates are somewhere around five to seven percent. 
that's great. I mean, that's a lot of people to, to screen that many people in the state of Michigan. That's, that's phenomenal. Um, I know more recently, this has nothing to do with hearing and vision, but I do know more recently that MDHHS is also uh, recently um, going to be, I guess, kind of implementing the dental screening or the oral health screening for children as well. And I think, I think that's of high value as well to be right up there with vision and hearing because, you know, if you have chronic tooth pain and you're experiencing challenges, you know, with oral health issues, that also can can really impact, you know, learning your ability to learn in school. So yeah, absolutely. That's great. Well, thank you for the work that you do at MDHHS and yeah. for providing that kind of screening. Um, is there anything else that we should be aware of that's, that's coming up or that's, you know, that you see is trending that's happening right now? Right now, you know, we're still reeling a little bit from the whole pandemic. Um, our, I have to give a shout out to all of the schools in Michigan because our programs would not be as successful as they are if they did not allow all of our technicians to come into the schools and screen kids within in their buildings. Um, our if, if parents had to bring kids to us, we probably wouldn't see 1% of the kids that we're seeing. So schools really are our allies and, and have made our programs so successful. Um, but back to COVID, obviously with kids not being in school, our program came to a standstill. This has never happened before. So it was something that really we were all just treading water thinking, how long is this going to go on? We lost a significant amount of staff. We're still seeing, you know, a lot of kids absent because you're seeing cycles of illness going through schools. We've always dealt with, you know, absent, a significant amount of kids being absent when flu hits a school. But now you have COVID on top of flu as well as other things. Um, one trend that was very interesting during COVID when everything first started, everybody was really great about kids wearing masks in school and kids socially distancing. And a lot of my technicians that I talked to said that the referral rate for hearing plummeted. It went down significantly. And the only thing I could figure is that kids were not in each other's space and in their, in, you know, in each other's faces. They had masks on. They weren't coughing on each other. They weren't head to head talking, you know. So the, the referral rate, the ear infection rate just went down significantly. Now that masks are really not being used that frequently in schools, you know, our referral rates are right back up there where they've always been. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think I think as a society right now, we're really playing catch up still, you know, getting back to some of those basic appointments and, and getting back on a schedule. Um, we've got about one minute left to go, and I just want to pose one more question real briefly to Dr. Rooney and Dr. Collard. Uh, if we have any listeners who are considering a career in either vision or hearing, what advice do you have for them? Hopefully we have some high school students and potential college students out there listening to tonight. Um, there's lots of routes into either vision or hearing, not necessarily the two things that Dr. Collard and I do. Um, I'm an MD, so I needed to do medical school and a residency and college. So if that's what you want to do, those are, that's your target. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we want to thank every all of our listeners and everyone for tuning in to tonight's UP Community Health Town Hall series. We will continue the series on a monthly basis. Um, we'll cover a different health topic every month, the last Thursday of the month between 7 and 8 p.m please join us. Uh, we will be posting this at nmu.edu slash rural health. Thank you for joining us.